you see with all the classes we did last uh with, with all the classes we did we actually concentrate we did everything in relation to the amino acid so in this part of biochemistry we are going to look at three basic concepts that is amino acid peptide and proteins so now we are going to start with uh, the peptides and then followed by proteins so I think if you could remember from our previous classes, I told you that we have 20 amino acids that are found, there are 20 amino acids that are found in proteins. So it means that all the amino acids that we have, all the amino acids that we have, there are more than 20 amino acids, but those that are found in the proteins are 20. There are 20, but there are more than, there are more than, 20 amino acid, but the ones that are found in proteins are 20. And these 20 amino acids are linked together. They're linked together. They're linked together through what you call a peptide bond. So it's these peptide bonds that join one amino acid with another to form either uh, peptides or proteins. So these 20 amino acids are linked together through peptide bond forming peptides or proteins. So the change, that is a change of the amino acids containing less than 50 amino acids are called peptides. So whenever you have a chain of an amino acid, a chain of an amino acids that contain, a chain of an amino acids that contain more than, uh, that contain more than 20, that, that contain more than uh, that contain more than or less than 50 amino acids. So that one is considered as peptides. And the one that contain uh, the one that contain more than 50 amino acids, they are called proteins. So you see, we start with amino acids. So we said amino acids contain carboxylic group, amino group, hydrogen, and then R side chain. And this R side chain is specific to amino acids. It's specific to amino acids. It's what actually makes one amino acid differ from one another. And so also at the same time, we have peptides. And what is peptides? Peptide is when you have two, three, four, up to 49 amino acids or up to 50 amino acids linked together through peptide bonds. They are called peptides. While those chain of an amino acids that have more than 50 amino acids are called proteins. So you should understand this. So and now the next thing that we are going to look at is the peptide bond formation. How is this pipe bond or how is this peptide bond are formed? So peptide bond they are formed by or between the carboxylic group of one amino acid and the amino group of another amino acid. So okay. remember, if you have two amino acids, so in the one amino, in the amino acid, you have carboxylic group and amino group. So if you have one amino acid and another amino acid, so the carboxylic group of one amino acid linked or joined with the amino group of another amino acids. And that bond that exists between two different functional groups is what you call peptide bonds. That is what you call peptide bond. So now let's look at this peptide bond very closely. So you see a peptide bond, look at it. This is one amino acid and this is another amino acid. So we have two amino acids and this is the carboxylic group of one amino acid and this is the amino group of another amino acid. So if you now look at it, you will see that the amino group of this, and this is it, and then the carboxylic group, which is this, they are now linked together. And this is what you call the peptide bond. Look at the peptide bond. This is the peptide bond. And sometimes we call it a mite, a mite bond. So this, when you have two amino acids joined together, we call it dipeptides, because you have two amino acids, and that is why it's called dipeptide. If you have three amino acids, then it's called 
tripeptide. If you have four amino acids joined together, it's called tetrapeptide. If you have 10 amino acids, you have decapeptide. So you should understand this. So the transconformation of the peptide. So you see, when these peptide bonds are formed, there is usually release of water molecule. A small molecule is released, which is water. So you see, as I was saying, peptides, a short polymer of an amino acid joins together by peptide, but they are classified by the number of amino acid in the chain. So dipeptide is when you have a molecule containing two amino acids joined together by peptide bond. And then there is also tripeptide. That is when you have three amino acids joined together. Then you have to work the 15 residues. If you have to work the 15 of the amino acids, 12 to 15, they are called oligopeptides. And then the next thing is we have polypeptides. So a polypeptide is a macromolecule containing many amino acids. That's linear polymer. In a linear form, that is without any kind of uh, branches that form. So amino acid monomers linked head to tail through formation of peptide bond. So out of a protein, a protein is a biological macromolecule of molecular weights. The molecular weight of protein is around 5,000 gram per mole or greater, consisting of more than one or consisting of one or more polypeptides. So it means that in the case of proteins, they have one or more polypeptide chain. They have one or more polypeptide chain. And the molecular weight of proteins is usually 5,000 gram per mole or greater than that. Okay. And then now we are going to look at the amide bond. Some of the main properties of an amide bond is it is low basicity, low basicity, which is usable in purification and it is stability into resonance. And basic amide synthesis is the reaction of carboxylic group and an amine with the loss of water. So you see, uh, there is a properties of actually amide bond and the properties of this amide bond which is it's what low basicity. What is basicity of an acid? When you say basicity of an acid, it means that it's actually the amount of hydrogen that is donated or that can actually give out by an acid. So the basic amide synthesis, so which is usable, so this low basicity of an amide bond is important, it's very, very important in terms of the peptide or um, protein purification as and the stability of the protein at the same time. And this low basicity is what makes it to have a resonance, and it's the resonance that makes it to be highly stable and actually usable as a marker of the protein purification. And then at the same time now, we are going to look at the basic MI synthesis is basic MI synthesis. So it's a reaction of carboxylic acid and an amino group with the loss of water. You see, so this is a carboxylic. If you look at it here, you see this is a carboxylic group and this is the amino group. So from here, we see that the carboxylic group here and the amino group, they now linked together to form this is what we call the amide bond. So this is the amide bond. And of course, you see that there is a loss of water molecule. So the water molecule is lost in the process. Okay. So now, since the free electrons of the nitrogen atoms are tight of informing a fascia, approximately 40% double bond. So N atom cannot accept a proton. That is in the amide bond here. Okay, so this nitrogen also has a fascial positive charge which will repel protons and prevent them from binding to the nitrogen plus no ionization. So it means that once you have an amide linkage, there is no ionization.
So now we are going to look at the peptide synthesis. How do you synthesize peptide? So the synthesis of a specific dipeptide such as lanine and glycine from alanine and glycine is complicated because both amino acids have two functional groups. So as a result, four products, namely alanine, 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 glycine, 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 and glycine, alanine are also weak. So you see, if you look at to to you see here, you want to synthesize alanine and glycine from alanine and glycine. So you want to synthesize a dipeptide of alanine and glycine from individual alanine and glycine. But this is very complicated because both the amino acids have the two functional groups. So there's a likelihood one alanine will join with another alanine, or one alanine will join with the, another with glycine or glycine with glycine, and then glycine alanine. But it's alanine glycine that we want to form. There is so there is a likelihood that any of these four combinations may actually be formed because of this. So fever synthesis is very difficult. So maybe you start first, you check, you test if you, if you get the product or not, then you now go ahead and do it several times until you achieve the product that you want to get. So in peptides, the, the method can be applied to, to synthesis of tripeptide and even larger one. So it's simple. And that's you can protect the nitrogen and you can also uh carboxyl protected amino acids. So you see it's, it's, it's simple. You can get to synthesize more than one uh, amino acids, so the, you can there is more than one peptide, dipeptide, tripeptide, anyone, but it is very complicated because of its nature. Then, what of the analysis of the amino acid sequence? So you can actually determine the amino acid sequence. That is the amino acid that are present in a particular polypeptide or proteins, and these are number one. You can determine the number of polypeptides first if you have a protein. Remember, I told you in proteins, you can have more than one polypeptide. So if you have a proton, first look at it and check at it. Check on it very well. How many of the amino acids does it have? Sorry, how many of the polypeptide chain does it have? Then that is first. And second, determine the number of disulfide bonds. Of course, remember methionine and uh, cysteine. They have thyroid functional group. So those kind of amino acids, they have the potential to produce disulfide bonds. So check on that also. And then determine the amino acid composition of each polypeptide chain. So first, maybe you have a protein, and in that protein, you have three polypeptide chains. Then you now go ahead and check the number of disulfide. Then you now look at each of those polypeptide chains. Then you now look at what are the composition of that amino acid, then if the units are large, then fragment them into shorter polypeptide chains. If those polypeptide chains, they are they are large, so you fragment them, you digest them in the smaller one. So then you now determine the amino acid sequence of each fragment using an Edmund depletion system or Edmund depletion method. So ladies and gentlemen, I think from here you can be able to understand how scientists can be used. Like now, for example, assuming you know for either you have maybe you isolated a particular protein from a, a cancer patient and you want to check if that protein is actually associated with the complication of that cancer. So how do you do it first? You check if maybe Okay, let me just give you a simple way. Assuming now you have you collected a blood from a cancer patient and from a normal patient, and you now want to check if there is a, a particular protein that are present in that kind of cancer patient that are absent in the normal individual, then of course you can do any kind of protein analysis and do the detection. Then after you detect and you will now want to know what are the amino acids that are present in that particular protein. So then the first thing that you now check what are the number of polypeptide chains that are flowing in that protein? So you do, 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 you do that first. And after you do that, then the next thing then, count the number of sulfide bridges that are there. And then you now go ahead to determine the amino acid composition of each polypeptide chain. But if the polypeptide chain is large enough, then you now fragment it. You digest it into smaller fragments. And then you now use Edmund degradation method to determine the 
amino acids presence that are there in the fragment. Okay. So now we also have a ways we have n n group analysis n group analysis. So the number of chain can be determined by identifying the number of n and c terminal. So assuming now first, if you remember, I told you if you now want to check the number of polypeptide chain. Remember, in the protein, protein may have more than one polypeptide chain. So how do you determine the number of polypeptide chain, or how do you number the number? How do you determine the number of chain? So first, you can identify the number of n and c terminal. So how do you determine the n terminal analysis? So the n terminal analysis can be done using benzyl chlorides, phenyl isothiocyanates, that is PITC or Edmund reagent. And you can use also a myonopeptides, which is an enzyme to determine the end terminal analysis or end terminal of an amino acid. So this is important, ladies and gentlemen. Please put this at the back of your mind. If you ask what are the methods that you can use to determine the end terminal of an amino acid or end terminal of the fabricant. So it's simple, these are the four. We have densal chloride, we have phenyl, isothiocyanate, we have amino this. So these are the three methods that you can do that. And then the next thing is there is also C terminal analysis. So you can either use N terminal analysis or three or C terminal analysis to determine the N group analysis of an amino acid. So example of this, you have uh, what you call carboxy peptides. So you can use this carboxy peptides to do it. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, I think this is the end of today's lecture. Unless if you have any question to ask, thank you for listening, you are a teacher.